Thanks, Alana. Okay, so welcome, Anouk. Uh, Anouk Borst is an assistant professor at KU Leuven and a senior researcher at the Royal Museum for Central Africa and Belgium. Uh, she holds a PhD in igneous petrology and economic geology from the University of Copenhagen, uh, where she was based at the Geological Survey of Denmark and Greenland. Uh, before coming to Belgium, she was a postdoc and lecturer at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. And her research mainly focuses on uh, critical metal deposits formed from highly evolved uh, peralkaline magmas and their weathering products. She was recently awarded the R.A. Howey Best Paper Award in 2021 for her work on rare earth elements in Udiliite, sorry, and uh, received the Mineralogical Society's Max Hay Medal uh, in 2021 for her outstanding contributions in the fields of uh, mineralogy and petrology. So, yeah, it's great to get someone with such a sort of diverse mix of uh, backgrounds, survey work, academic work, mineralogy, processing, or formation. Uh, we're really happy to have you on, Anouk, and uh, yeah, thanks for coming on uh, to be one of our last speakers for 2021. The next, next 30 minutes or so are yours. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Tom and Alana, for that introduction and for the invitation to present. Uh, so uh, I'm just going to minimize myself in the top corner there. Uh, welcome, everyone uh, from all over the world. It's great to see people tuning in. Uh, I will talk about my favorite subject today, um, uh, the highly evolved baralkaline systems and their associated critical metal resources. Uh, I will mainly talk about the rare earths in this case, but um, high field strength elements uh, like niobium is also part of these systems. So let me see if um, it's okay, it's moving to the next page. That's great. All right, uh, so this is work from uh, yeah, the past 10 years or so, including my PhD and my postdoc. Uh, and uh, moving forward, I will uh, mostly focus on Africa, but this talk is mainly about Greenland. Um, but I will uh, make it very general uh, for everyone to follow, and I will refer to many uh, places across the world. So uh, I'll start with a bit of uh, why, what, where, and how on the peralkaline igneous complexes, why we're interested in them, uh, where they form, how they form. And then uh, I'll highlight the key ore forming processes, both the magmatic side and um, most, uh, of the, uh, the of most of the time, I'll, I will focus on the hydrothermal processes that really affect the uh, distribution of the high field strength elements and the rare earths in these deposits. Uh, and that includes automatosomatism and phenotization. Uh, weathering is also an important process, but I will not really focus on that in this talk. Uh, the examples I will use are mainly from the Ilemausa complex in Greenland and the Ilefiselic complex, which is a lesser well-known complex, but we have a recent paper out on that, uh, particularly looking at the phenotization there. And then finally, I want to refer to uh, new 3D geo models uh, that we have in revision um, as a uh, main outcome of the high-tech Alcar project. Uh, well, I'll get to that in, at the end of the presentation. So uh, first, some introduction on the rare earths. I think most of the people in the audience here are quite uh, familiar with um, why we're interested in rare earth elements and why we need them. Um, so they're mainly used in the magnet industry and the catalyst industry. Uh, China had a long dominance on the rare earth production, uh, although this has, has sort of dropped in the recent years from, from uh, well, about nine, 98% in 2011 uh, to 58% in 2010. Uh, but where do we find them? Uh, dominantly, they're mined from ion adsorption clays, which are um, well, soft sediments, and the rare earths are leached from, from clay minerals. Uh, and then we have carbonatites, which are hard rock deposits, where the rare earths are hosted in, uh, in either phosphates or fluorocarbonates, like monazite and parasite. Uh, Besnesite also, and um, high field strength element oxides like pyrochlor are also important in the carbonatites. And then the third uh, uh, or, uh, category of rare earth deposits are the peralkaline igneous rocks or the peralkaline silicates, uh, which are often associated with the carbonatites, uh, but the, the mineralogy that hosts the rare earth elements is very different uh, and, and most of the rare earths are hosted in silicates, very complex silicates like 
udialite and steenstropine are, are the ones that I will talk about mostly in this presentation. So uh, the pre-alkaline rocks um, provide uh, enormous alternative supply to the, the current um, well, the deposits that are being mined for rare earth elements like the, IAD, the ion absorption deposits and the carbonatites, uh, the ion absorption deposits on, sorry, can you see my, my mouse is? Uh, yeah, yeah, we can up. see it. Uh, is it uh, the Maybe laser? Maybe better go laser yeah, point. Back to the laser. All right, so the ion absorption deposits um, are typically low grade, uh, but very large. So on this plot, we have uh, grade versus tonnage. Uh, it doesn't really show the ion absorption deposits, but they sort of sit around here at the, the lower grade, the grade, below one weight percent of rare earth oxides. Whereas uh, the carbonatites are typically a bit higher grade. So we have bion oboe is the, the key one uh, to look at, uh, which produces most of the, the world's uh, light rare earth oxides. Uh, and then lots of the heavy rare earths come from these ion absorption clays. Now on this plot, it shows the silicate, the peralkaline silicate hosted um, uh, deposits that are not being produced yet, uh, but names I want you to remember are Kvenefeld, Lobo Zero, Kringlerne. These are really, really big deposits that are over 10 million tons, um, with over 10 mil million tons of, uh, of rare earth oxides. Uh, but yet we are not, not mining them. So there's really plenty of rare earth element uh, deposits. That's the main takeaway here. Uh, but the, there are many challenges in, in producing, bringing this into to production. And the key challenges there are uh, the fact that they have such complex mineralogy that they're quite difficult to process, uh, which means that every deposit requires a unique uh, development of, of the processing sheet, uh, different, different extraction methods that have to be optimized for the specific deposit. And then it's not really the grade, but it's really the, the ease of extraction or the mineralogy that controls the, the economic viability of these projects um, and, and the availability of, or the infrastructure that is available to process the ore. Then uh, the added complexity is the rare earth balance problem uh, that you're probably all familiar with. Uh, we're mainly looking for neodymium and praseodymium. Those are the highly valued ones, um, the uh, high value rare earths for the mark, the magnet industry, as well as the heavy rare earths, which are much less abundant than say, lanthanum and cerium of which we have an oversupply. So we're looking for the deposits that are more enriched in these highly valued elements. And it's the basket price that again, controls the economics of these deposits. Uh, then the third one is the environmental issues. Uh, so some or many of them are associated with uranium and thorium. Uh, and then the geopolitics become really complicated as um, I will get to uh, in the example of Greenland as well. So uh, a bit of uh, basic igneous petrology then. Um, what do I mean with peralkaline igneous complexes? Uh, they're typically very large uh, circular shaped intrusion or subcircular of highly evolved, highly fractionated um, uh, magmas that are often silica undersaturated, but not necessarily, they can be silica saturated, uh, but it's the main, the main thing that makes them peralkaline is the, uh, the amount of sodium plus potassium relative to aluminum. So uh, we need to have, uh, or basically we have more sodium plus potassium than we have uh, aluminum. And this controls the mineralogy we get minerals like adrene and uh, sodium amphiboles. These magmas are really highly enriched in incompatible elements as the final products of fractionation. Uh, so they contain all the, all the metals that we consider incompatible that don't uh, uh, fit into the structure of, of uh, other minerals like olivine and, and uh, feldspar, et cetera. So we get uh, enrichments in rare earth elements, iconium, titanium, uh, lithium, beryllium, uranium, thorium, phosphor, and also volatiles, um, mainly the halogens like uh, fluorine and chlorine. And this makes them very interesting multi-commodity resources. Uh, they're also very low viscosity magmas due to the high amounts of, uh, of uh, 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 sorry, I come, 
can't come up with the word. Uh, uh, so they're very low viscosity magmas, which makes them, uh, which make them layered, and you see um, uh, extensive in situ magmatic fractionation occurring in these intrusions. Uh, yeah, we typically avoid them in igneous petrology classes because of their bewildering rock names, a very complicated mineralogy. Uh, but uh, as you'll see, often they're just Nephilim cyanides, is what it comes down to. So here's one example of a rock from, from Greenland that uh, has some of these weird minerals. Um, they're also very pretty uh, under UV uh, light sometimes. So if you follow me on Twitter, you might have seen some of these images. Uh, so this is sodalite, uh, green sodalite, which fluorescence bright orange uh, with feldspar that uh, fluorescence uh, pink in this case, and then we have an NLCM, and the main ore mineral is uh, steenstropine, which is this brown mineral. It's a rare earth uh, uranium zirconophosphosilicate complex mineral. Where do we find them? Uh, typically, we find them uh, in, in extensional tectonic settings. Uh, so this is most of the time uh, continental rifts uh, where we uh, have uh, adiabatic melting of the mantle, uh, producing low degree partial melts of uh, ideally um, already metasomatized uh, lithospheric mantle that then experience extensive fractionation uh, as they ascend into the crust before they are in place. Uh, we can also find them in intraplate settings where you have low degree melting of, um, of uh, edges of, on the edges of plumes or sometimes, uh, in, to a lesser extent, post-collisional settings. Uh, and we find them pretty much all over the world. Um, this, uh, this diagram doesn't show all of them, but it shows some of the, the, the bigger projects and the main ones that we have compared in a, rec uh, in a recent uh, paper, hopefully coming out soon. Uh, so, in this talk, I will focus mostly on the Lemausa complex, uh, but also want you uh, to notice the Bionobo mine, which is a carbonatite. Uh, let me see. Uh, the Kabini and Lovisero complexes in Russia. And um, yeah, they're, uh, they're basically uh, distributed uh, in age. So they're both uh, ranging from Proterozoic to, to very young uh, Cenozoic intrusions uh, and occurring in these three main um, uh, tectonic settings, as I mentioned before. So going from uh, looking at the key ore forming processes, um, we can distinguish the magmatic and the hydrothermal. Uh, this is a, a, a nice diagram from Catherine Goodenough uh, that uh, shows the geometry of some of these intrusions, and I mainly want you to focus on the alkaline silicate complexes. This is a carbonatite model. Uh, so the, we start out with, with the primary processes of a low, low degree partial melting of the fertile mantle source to produce um, an alkali basaltic melt. These are then uh, fractionated in the crust uh, to become more enriched in the incompatible elements. And once they are enriched uh, to uh, the peralkaline stage, they become in place and we get um, cumulate processes and roof zone uh, crystallization processes to form these ore, big ore deposits. Uh, then, moving. Uh, because these magmas are so enriched in volatiles and fluids, uh, you often have an extensive overprinting uh, of, of um, hydrothermal overprinting of the primary ore minerals. Uh, so we, these are processes we call automatosomatism. Uh, when those fluids uh, are expelled into the country rock, we talk about phenotization. Uh, and these processes can really uh, significantly remobilize the metals of interest, or at least change the mineralogy significantly and thus changing the, the, the processing. Uh, required to, to, um, to extract the metals. So I will look at these processes in more detail. Uh, then of course, to be able to reach uh, these deposits, we need to have uh, erosion and uplift uh, to get them, bring them to the surface. And then we have a third process uh, that can also influence how we can extract the metals or the enrichment itself uh, is the supergene process at subtropical weathering. Um, which is not really important in Greenland, but is important when you look at 
uh, tropical areas like in, in Africa. Uh, so this was a big topic that we looked at at the SOS Rare project. Uh, okay, so uh, on the igneous uh, evolution uh, of, of, of these magmas, uh, we typically start out with something that is just, so this is a test diagram for those of you uh, are not familiar with it, that's uh, plotting the sodium uh, and potassium content versus the silica content. Uh, these magmas typically start out as a, as a simple al alkali basalt or a nephilinite, which then fractionate all the way to uh, a phonolytic composition or a, a phoidite composition. Uh, we can also go to silica enrichment and end up in a, uh, in a granitic or rhyolitic composition as well. Uh, but the main uh, thing, again, I want to highlight is the peralkalinity or the peralkaline index, uh, where uh, when the sodium and potassium over aluminium ratio becomes greater than one, uh, we talk about a, a peralkaline complex, but when they become even more enriched in sodium and potassium, we talk about acpeidic rocks. And I'll explain what that means in a second. So uh, we when the uh, sodium plus potassium ratio exceeds one, uh, we will crystallize minerals like feldspar and nepheline, which have uh, elemental ratios of one. Uh, but when, when that exceeds uh, one, the overall, the whole rock content, um, um, sorry, the whole rock uh, sodium plus potassium ratio exceeds 1.2, we start to see uh, these other minerals that are, have even higher uh, amounts of sodium to get rid of all our sodium and potassium. Uh, so that is the, sorry, the fractionation diagram. Uh, and the more peralkaline it gets, the more of these feldspathoids we start to see, like sodalite and even usingite, which have an e even higher sodium over aluminum ratio. Uh, then on top of that, uh, to get rid of all of our sodium, we also start to crystallize uh, high field strength elements, um, uh, minerals, complex high field strength element minerals like eudialite, rinkite, and berterite. Uh, instead of normal high field strength element phases like zircon or ilmenite. And this is when we, when, when we start to see these minerals, this is when we call them acpaietic, uh, and that distinguishes them from a normal peralkaline rock, which is not very interesting in terms of the uh, our economic content, um, which we call a meoschitic rock. So meoschitic rocks have just zircon, titanite, or ilmenite. Uh, uh, whereas ecpeidic rocks is when we, we get these uh, funky, rare earth rich minerals like eudialite and steenstropine. All right, uh, so they're really not that rare as, as you might think. Uh, they do occur uh, all over the world and there's about a hundred localities worldwide, although more uh, ecpeidic uh, rocks are still being discovered. Uh, for example, in Mexico, there's one that's not on here. Uh, there's some in Angola that are not on here. Um, but yeah, uh, acpeidic rocks are, uh, are quite abundant in fact, uh, but in most cases, the, these mineral assemblages like eudialite, we find them in the final stages as smaller units within a, a larger meoschitic intrusion, and only in very rare cases, the, the, these units make up the entire intrusion. So those are the ones that we are, of course, interested in. And the key examples there are Kibini and Lovazira, both in the Kola Peninsula, which are really massive. So here we have uh, the scale of 10 kilometers. Kibini is, around, is about 40 kilometers wide uh, and thereby is the largest uh, layered acpeidic intrusion. Um, then we have Ilimausak, which is a little bit smaller, uh, um, 17 by uh, eight kilometers wide. Uh, here's another in, uh, example, Ambohimi Rahavavi from Madagascar, which both contains cyanides and, and granites uh, and has a, a weathering deposit on top of it. Uh, and here also Bletchford Lake, which I want to point out the Nature Lodge layered suite is a smaller uh, ecpeidic unit within a larger meoschitic uh, cyanide or Tor Lake cyanides. Uh, just putting this diagram up again, uh, so the grade versus tonnage of some of these uh, deposits. And again, uh, all of these, they, they are uh, similar in size to bionobo, 
And if you then take into account that Bionobo has been supplying most of the rare, the libraries for the uh, well, globally, then you will also realize that if we just produce, start to produce one of these, uh, we could satisfy the rare earth demand uh, for years to come. All right, so uh, again, now I'm going into detail on the, on the Ilimausa complex, um, which uh, was the topic of my PhD. Uh, the Ilimausa complex is uh, part of the uh, Mesa Proterozoic Garda Rift province in southern Greenland. Uh, these represent the most evolved melts within that, within that uh, rift zone, and it's currently exposed at an a, at a emplacement level of about four, to, four kilometers depth. Uh, this is really a famous mineral locality with over 220 minerals that were identified uh, from, from here uh, of, uh, in this locality and 33 that were first discovered here, uh, including uh, udiolite itself uh, and sodalite, agerine, and many of these minerals. There's two deposits or two big rare earth projects uh, in this, uh, this uh, complex. So we have to the south, we have the King Lerner deposit uh, in these blue rocks here, which is the floor cumulate. And then uh, we have the Kvenefeld project to the north of the fjord, uh, uh, basically up here. So uh, a quick uh, idea of what this, the structure of this intrusion looks like. Uh, the first few uh, intrusive units are quite minor. Uh, so they were, it was an augite cyanide and an alkali granite in the roof zone here. and then the Dominant uh, intrusive units are these highly evolved uh, ecpaietic uh, uh, magmas that crystallized first from the top down. So we had sodalite crystals that were accumulating in the roof of this mag magma chamber, and then uh, the interstitial magmas crystallizing around it. So you see here the big eudialite crystals that surround uh, euhedral sodalites uh, and then big uh, amphibole, sodic amphiboles as well. Uh, so this rock is called a Nauiaite, a local name. Then uh, from the, the bottom up, we had uh, layered floor cumulus. So this is a beautiful rhythmic sequence of, uh, of um, Nephilim cyanides where, where there's a modal layering in uh, the amount of uh, amphibole and eudialite and feldspar. Uh, so these are called the picorticites. And then the most evolved melts end up in the middle of the intrusion and uh, basically intrude into the earlier crystallized roof zone. And we call those the lead of rights. So the two, the, uh, so all of these are, uh, they have complex na local names, but they're all basically the same rock type, nepheline cyanides with the same minerals, just in different proportions, different textures. And then we have these two deposits there. Uh, all right, so that, uh, the. The bottom uh, uh, of the intrusion, the lower part of the intrusion, the floor cumulus is um, uh, explored by a company called Tembris. Uh, and these are really enormous uh, resources. So that's 4.3 billion tons uh, of, uh, of resources at uh, about two weight percent zirconium oxide uh, and 0.2 weight percent niobium oxide and half a weight percent total rare earth oxide. So it's quite low or medium grade. Uh, but all the, of the rare earths are hosted in, in this uh, mineral called eudialite and some accessory minerals. And you see here a detail of one of those, one of those layers. Uh, so it's basically a repetition of black, red, and white layers. Uh, and there's about 27 or 29 of them exposed. And just for scale, uh, I'm zooming in here to this, this uh, waterfall. And I added some people here for scale. So each one of these units is about eight meters thick. It's really a gigantic deposit. All of this is considered ore. Uh, the eudialite would be extracted by magnetic uh, separation, but it's a lot of rock to move uh, for all of the rare earth. Um, all right, so the, uh, the ore mineral itself um, is uh, the eudialite group minerals, which are really complex group of minerals, um, sodium, calcium, iron, zircono, silicate, with lots of volatiles. Uh, uh, the rare earth content can vary from one to 10 weight percent uh, with 12% zirconium oxide and, and a bit of niobium as well. And the attractive thing about eudialyte then is that is the rare earth profile, which is quite enriched in the heavy rare earths, or it has a, a flat to heavy rare earth uh, enriched profile. 
Uh, these are eudialites from different locations. Um, and they are fairly easy to separate magnetically, um, although the extraction or the processing has not yet been uh, demonstrated at the industrial scale. And there, are, for example, there are some issues with uh, silica gel formation when you start to dissolve these minerals. Uh, but a lot of work is being done on that right now. So it's, it is still a potential mineral um, for rare earth elements in the future. Uh, then uh, moving on to that roof zone um, deposit in the, in the Ilamause complex, uh, we have the Kvenefeld rare earth uranium zinc deposit. Uh, this one is explored by Greenland uh, Minerals and Energy. And the rare earths and the uranium in this case are hosted in steam which basically replaces eudialite when the system has been exhausted in, uh, or depleted in zirconium uh, and more enriched in phosphor uh, and uranium. And then there's also zinc uh, hosted in sphalerite. Uh, again, these are really uh, significant resources. However, this uh, the deposit um, has run into some uh, problems basically uh, with um, the recent Greenlandic uh, elections, which has have implemented a new ban on uranium mining. So this has uh, potentially come to a temporary halt. Uh, who knows? Uh, the uranium issue uh, uh, concentrations of 400 ppm is, uh, yeah, is the main issue here. Uh, so then the effect, let me check time. Okay, uh, yeah. So I've mentioned uh, the importance of late magnetic fluids in these system, which, uh, uh, can cause widespread alteration of these primary magmatic ore minerals uh, as these mag these fluids sit uh, uh, and oh, as these, these systems sort of stew in their own juices, uh, the minerals become replaced. Uh, so we have an example here of a of a nice primary eudialite crystal with sector zoning, and this can become um, entirely replaced by secondary minerals. So we call that a, a pseudomorphic replacement, uh, where the rare earth elements. Uh, the zirconia and the niobium separate themselves into, into the uh, distinct minerals. Um, so we have worked quite a bit on trying to um, uh, get the mass balance on these pseudomorphs to see whether or not rare earth elements or the elements of interest were either lost or gained during this, uh, this process. But it seems that uh, most, of the, uh, most of the time these metals are largely contained within the deposit uh, the main thing is that it, it changes the, the minerality and thus uh, how we extract uh, the metals from the rock. So this is really important to uh, characterize in each deposit every time uh, you are exploring uh, or uh, characterizing one of these peralkaline deposits, you have to really look at the replacement textures. Uh, so here are other examples from Nature Lot Show, uh, from uh, Ambohimi Ravavi and another Greenland um, uh, intrusion, where again, you see this pseudomorphic replacement of, uh, of eudialite in this case, but it could be other rare earth minerals as well, other primary minerals. All right, then when the, met, the, the fluids, uh, so the, in this case, the fluids um, are maintained in the intrusion and, and uh, change the local mineralogy, but uh, the fluids can also be expelled into the country rock uh, this is the process we call phenotization. Uh, and this is commonly observed in, in uh, or around carbonatites uh, and is, has been a useful tool for exploration. Um, it's named after the Fen complex in Norway. Uh, so it causes, a, it basically forms an aureole around the, uh, the intrusion. Uh, and uh, going from the country rock with increasing alteration or increasing, increasing fluid flow from the uh, intrusion, you can see a change in mineralogy. Uh, these ecbiotic complexes that I just talked about typically don't have very uh, wide phenite zones, which uh, points to the fact that they are holding on to their fluid quite, quite well. And this is an important step in their magmatic evolution. Uh, but then there are some uh, alkaline silicate complex that do have quite thick phenite zones around them, but these are not mineralized. So there's a really important link there that I want to uh, look into. So uh, this is work done by Chris uh, Sokol, the PhD uh, student in, at the University of St. Andrews. Uh, his PhD was mainly about the, uh, the another intrusion in the Garda province. So here's Ilemausak that we have already discussed in detail. 
and only 20 kilometers to the east of it, we have a coeval intrusion called Illerfixalic or Iggy Figgy uh, for short, um, that is quite similar, but it doesn't host any mineralization. Uh, and they're uh, what we call these miasketic cyanides. So they just have zircon and titanite. Uh, it is in place in granite and in sandstones from, and basalts from this early rift um, Eric Short formation, like the Lamasic complex. All right, so Chris uh, has done extensive fieldwork in this area uh, uh, to, to document the phenotization process around Ilofisalik and documented a 400 meter wide uh, metasomatic oreo where he documented changes in the, in the chemistry and the mineralogy and the textures of these, of these aranitic sandstones. Um, so uh, compositional analysis uh, uh, then um, placed into uh, element or created element maps from these uh, uh, whole rock uh, compositional data. Uh, show the changes in chemistry uh, with distance from the intrusion. Uh, so we have calcium here, uh, the, the rare earth ratio, uh, zirconium, niobium, tantalum contents, titanium contents, and then the alkali, sodium, and potassium. And we see that there's a fairly narrow zone of enrichment in calcium and, and potassium. Uh, and then there are a much wider zone of enrichment, relative enrichment in sodium, titanium and rare earths. Uh, Chris then proceeded to, to perform a, a geometry-based volume calculation just, just to get a, a rough idea of how much uh, high field strength elements or how many rare earths were flushed out into the country rock from this intrusion. And that uh, was quite, the results of that were quite shocking uh, to all of us, I think. Um, so this plot shows uh, a number of uh, deposits and the total rare earth oxide in million tons. So inc with increasing con uh, tonnage is basically this direction. Uh, the biggest deposit here, uh, number one is by an oboe, then the second one, uh, Moro dos Sais Lagos, and then we have Kringlen uh, number three here. And the Ilerfisilic phenite, the amount of rare earths and high field strength elements contained in the phenite uh, we calculated was, very, was similar to that of Kringlerna. Uh, at 43 million tons. So this was really impressive. And um, yeah, these results uh, were recently published in geology. So we'll check out that paper if you're interested in this. Uh, but what this really suggests is that the, the process of phenotization can really have an enormous impact on the evolution of these melts. So when we do lose the fluid, fluids and the metals and the, and the alkalis to the country rock, uh, perhaps this is what uh, prevents these magmas from reaching that acreotic stage like we see at Ilemausak. All right, so finally, um, uh, all of this uh, work we've, we've worked on or studied uh, alkaline intrusion across the world as part of uh, or a big team. This one is led by Charlie Baird and Catherine Goodenough as part of the high tech Alcarb team, uh, who have then uh, created 3D models uh, to to integrate all of this mineralogical and, and um, structural information, as well as metallurgical information from these different deposits around the world uh, into a 3D coherent model. Uh, hopefully this will soon be published so you can actually zoom in and out of this, uh, this 3D model uh, and, and play with it and, and look at all the different components of, of the, uh, these systems. So here is uh, the zoomed in version of, of one of these acrobatic layered suites uh, of which Ilimausik is the type example. Uh, and yeah, I would uh, invite you to, to keep an eye out for this paper coming out hopefully soon. All right. Uh, right, final conclusions then. Uh, so summarizing the key stages in the evolution of uh, peralkaline magmas and these deposits, uh, we start with the mantle. We basically need a, a relatively fertile mantle source and low degree of part uh, partial melting to produce these alkali basaltic melts that already have uh, lots of um, high field strength elements and halogen contents that then will um, be fractionated in the crust. So the next stage 
is the crust where we have like fractionation taking over. Uh, we need uh, extreme or fractional crystallization of large amounts of anertite, for example, and olivine uh, that allow this extended fractionation in, uh, towards per alkaline composition. Uh, but in most cases, we don't reach that uh, super evolved acbiotic stage, and there's something extra that we need, and that is that we need to maintain the volatiles in the melt. If we don't, we just start to crystallize a meoschitic, uh, uh, not so enriched melts, and we lose the metals to the country rock, or we don't get these acbiotic intrusions. So how do we maintain the melts, uh, the volatiles in the melt? Uh, one of the key factors there is oxygen fugacity uh, and uh, maintaining a low silica and, and water activity so that we prevent the exolution of uh, sodium rich fluids and volatiles. Uh, this subsequently enhances the solubility of the high flow strength elements, the rare earths and the alkalis and lowers the solid uh, temperatures as well. So it allows even further fractionation in situ within the intrusion. So this enables the fractionation to go beyond the meoschitic stage uh, towards uh, concentrating the high filtric elements in, in acbiotic minerals. Uh, and with that, uh, some final thoughts. So uh, layered peralkaline intrusions uh, form really large deposits that uh, hopefully someday we can, we can utilize um, only some of them have been histor historically mined, uh, for example, those in the Kola uh, Peninsula. Uh, but over the past few years, we have made significant progress in, the, in their understanding. And um, hopefully these 3D models will also aid uh, future exploration and exploitation. Uh, the main points that I wanna uh, leave you with is that uh, for, uh, uh, sustainable future exploration of these of these deposits. Uh, the important thing is developing the infrastructures and the methods required to process them, and then we rely on geopolitical decisions like um, the Greenland uh, decision to, to ban uranium mining really impacting that project. Um, and then yes, of course, we cannot get to set net zero without the social mining to license, uh, <laughs> social license to mine. <laughs> I was already at the final slide. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks, Anuk. That was a really, really good uh, summary of some pretty complicated ideas and, and names and mineral names and rock names as well. Uh, yeah, I'm impressed how much information you managed to fit into that 30 minutes while still keeping it accessible to me who, who couldn't even pronounce your dialect at the beginning of the talk. <laughs> so... Michael Annenberg has chimed in. He's got a question. Michael, uh, you can just unmute yourself, I think. Hopefully, or maybe I haven't. Yeah, sorry, now it should work. Yeah, fascinating stuff. Um, I have a bunch of questions. Uh, you know, I'm coming from a carbonatite background and you know, as you said in the beginning, those are uh, pretty much the same magmas that carbonatites are invisible from. So would you say that one of the key things for depositing one of those uh, in, in a peralkaline magma is to not have the carbonatite exhaled from it when it forms? And if yes, is that something that, no, so Satan, if you have a carbonatite around, is that something that almost certainly uh, it determines that a peralkaline rock would not be mineralized because everything ended up in, in the carbonatite. Very good question. Hi, Michael. Uh, nice to see you. Um, yeah, so that is one of the things uh, we still need to work on, uh, I think. So in this 3D um, model, geomodel project, the high-tech all carb project that you are uh, probably familiar with, um, we have both compared the alkaline silicate system and the carbonatite system. And as I mentioned, um, many of the alkaline silicate system of these peralkaline uh, deposits do come associated with some or uh, with minor carbonatite intrusions. So uh, the, um, the Lova Zero ones, for example, uh, Kibini has uh, some um, carbonatites associated with it. 
uh, but it's relatively small compared to the amount of the, the volume of silicate magma. Uh, and yes, I do think when you so uh, when you do form a carbonatite or exolve a carbonatite from uh, these from these magmas, that it will take up most of the rare earths. Uh, but to what extent it prevents uh, an ecbiotic magma from forming? Uh, well, clearly it doesn't uh, prevent it because we do we do find these intrusions that both have carbonatites and uh, per, uh, ecbiotic magmas associated with each other. But yeah, the big ones that are super ecbiotic have only small carbonatized bodies associated with them. So I think it's um, a proportion question. Um, but yeah, I think there's a lot of experimental work that we could do on, on that. Um, yeah, figuring out when carbonic uh, liquids exhale from, from these magmas. Uh, or if it's quite carbonate poor, then we, we don't have big carbonate, carbonatites forming um, or exolving from the silicate magnets. And then we can really push through into the ecbiotic field. But yeah, there's a, a lot of um, field sites that we can still study better also in, in Africa, which I'm hoping to do in the future. Okay, thanks. I uh, have some more, but I think I'll. Uh... Let others ask first. Give there are any. All right. Uh, yeah, there's a there's a short and sweet question or comment there from Anthony Burnham. Anthony, do you want to hop in and yeah, thank, talk about that? Thanks, Anup. Uh, great talk. Um, I was interested. You, you mentioned obviously that there's a risk that too much water and then you exolve it out and it goes off and forms a phenite and you kind of spread out your critical metals too widely. Is there a kind of be a risk of being too dry and then you don't fractionate in the same way and concentrate your metals down so much? So is uh, there some kind of sweet spot of the, like the best amount of water to have to really distill everything into one place and keep it there? Yeah, th yeah, that's an, also a good question to ask. Um, I don't know, to be honest, I don't know the, the water content of these initial magmas, I think it's quite hard to estimate uh, both the, fluor the the halogen content and the and the water content of of the magmas as they evolve. Uh, again, I think there's a lot to be done there on the experimental side of things, just to see what controls the fractionation paths, the exolution, the minerals that we're crystallizing and fractionating out of the system. Um, yeah, yeah, that is a really good. Good question. If there's, if it's too dry, I don't think we will um, reach the stage at all. We do need the, the the halogens and the and the volatiles, and then again, the oxygen fugacity is also a key player. Thanks. Michael will like that. And <laughs> Ralph, you've uh, dropped a question in there. Would you like to ask that yourself, or give you a second? Yes, I can. Great. Um, yeah, thanks, Anouk. Excellent talk. Very interesting. Uh, I was wondering, because you showed all these fluids escaping from uh, Ilafisa leak, uh, is that ob observed at Ilimausa as well? And why do you think there's a difference, given that the host talks are, uh, I presume, rather similar, and the magmas probably come from a similar source as well? Yeah. Again, excellent question. Uh, they did um, intrude into the same uh, host rocks, both intruded into Juliana Hope Granite and Eric's Fjord basalts and sandstones. Uh, however, um, in Ilemausak, it seems that the earlier intrusive units, uh, the Audrey cyanide and the uh, alkali granites, formed sort of a, a, a cap in, in which the ecbitic melts could intrude. But, I think here the, the real answers might already happen uh, at the deeper stage also, where we need to have the, the magmas reaching that ecbiotic stage in, in, in deeper magma chambers that were then in place into um, a contained uh, shallow intrusion where the fluids were not able to exolve anymore. Uh, so at Ilamausek, they refer to an impermeable, impermeable roof zone. 
but why we don't have that in Ilefriselic, I, I really don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know. Maybe Chris has some ideas, Chris Sokol, who has uh, done all this work on uh, Ilefriselic. But yeah, again, still lots to be. Uh, Great, thank you. Yeah. Cool. I don't know if Chris is in the, in the list somewhere, but do feel free to jump in. Any, any experts on this stuff? Uh, till then, I've got an interesting question on YouTube from Anna Bidgood, and it's, does the uranium content of the intrusions vary within the Gada pro province? Is there potential for other rare earth element deposits in the area with lower uranium? Um, yeah, uh, definitely. So the uranium content um, varies a lot already within within the Ilamausa complex. So the, the big advantage or geopolitical advantage of that uh, floor cumulate deposit, the Kringlern deposit, is that it doesn't have uranium associated with uh, the rare earth. So the udilite is doesn't contain much uranium at all, uh, whereas the seenstropine is a uranium bearing mineral. So all of the uranium and thorium were enriched into this final melt uh, that then intruded into the roof zone, forming Kvenefjeld. Uh, so that, that is already a big difference, uh, a distinction between these two deposits in the same intrusion. Then we have other uh, deposits like Motsfeld also in the Garda province, which is also quite, um, yeah, radioactive. Uh, so there, the, that's a niobium tantalum deposit, uh, a roof zone deposit, where the niobium tantalum is hosted in pyrochlor. And um, yeah, again, the uranium and thor thorium contents are quite high, but not as high as in, in the Kvenefeld project. Don't know Maybe jump in with a, a quick follow-up there. And I was just wondering, you know, there seem to be quite, quite a few similarities within this area, but then these differences. And does that influence or tell us something about the um, fertility in the mantle? Uh, like why are we having more uranium in one less than the other? Is that so deep a process or is that something that's coming further up? Uh, all of these in the Garda provinces is a really interesting case study because we can assume that all of these magmas came roughly from the same type of mantle source. So that we've also done uh, lots of studies using radiogenic isotopes and the hafnium isotopes and sulfur isotopes to look into the mantle sources and the variation uh, across the rift for both Ilebausek, Motsfeld, comparing these. Uh, but, but they probably all started out roughly similar composition and then the fractionation paths were different. However, the sulfur and hafnium isotope do suggest that there was variation in the degree of metasomatism across the rift. So uh, potentially, um, so both, because the, there is a, the metasomatism was subduction related. So there's a geometry effect of, of, the, sub, of the subduction causing the metasomatism. Uh, then when we had the rift uh, 500 million years later, these, um, the melting may, might have affected different zones that were, um, metasomatized to different degrees, uh, depending on the depth and, and the north-south trends. So that's a, a, a paper from uh, Will, Will, Will Hutchison, also from St. Andrews, um, in uh, Earth and Planetary Science Letters, looking at the sulfur isotopes across the Gardar province to look at the, the metasomatism of the mantle. Great, thanks. Mm. And this, it, it, in the end, a lot of these deposits will come down to the uranium thorium or the, the general deleterious elements problem. Have you, apart from, you mentioned, you know, evolving the magnets more tends to, like the more evolved portions of these complexes are often more uranium thorium rich. Apart from that, have you thought about magmatic processes or simulation processes that might favorably fractionate uranium or th thorium will be harder than maybe uranium being redox sensitive from, from our magmas that, so that we could, people could target areas that might have, you know, uranium poor type deposits? Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's a good, good question. I think that this is something 
we re we looked at a lot in the in this these geo model um, studies to try and and put all of it together from all these different intrusions and their different compositions, the radioactivity, etc. Um, yeah, that, that, was, that was a bit of a, a complex question, I suppose. But uh, yeah, yeah, I know. I don't. I didn't that, necessarily think it had an answer. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, I don't. But it, it probably. It's just the fact that we see some deposits have low uranium, some have high uh, uranium and thorium. Um, what really controls it? I, I, yeah, I, I don't know, but yeah, untangling it I from think, the simple think, fractionation control. The key point too is that we're not gonna, we're probably not gonna find massive new uh, deposits of, of of these ecbiotic intrusions. We we already know where they are. <laughs> we just need to decide which if we are gonna mine them or um, or not if we. Yeah, these big deposits might never be developed. I don't know. Maybe we start with smaller intrusions that have uh, small local like veins of ecbiotic uh, minerals, uh, or we continue to mine the, the carbonatites. And some of them are also uh, enriched in heavy rare earths uh, or come with low uranium contents. Uh, there's a project in Namibia, for example, uh, the Eureka project. Uh, that hosts monazite because still uh, we have to keep in mind that these zirconosilicates are quite difficult to process um, compared to say the fluorocarbonates or the, the, the rare phosphates yeah so yeah it's complicated. okay well no, it's obviously thinking about it i have to read you, your papers for those kind of important speculative bits right yeah, I'll put the papers back up here. <laughs> uh, Michael, do you want to jump back in there? Michael Annenberg, that is. Yeah, sure. Me and my friend here. Yeah, um, <laughs> your colleague. Yeah, so, <laughs> uh, you showed in, in one of your slides that um, when when you have this automatosomatism, usually what happens is that you, know, you have a mineral and then in the same place, the elements don't really move and then just have other minerals or the same thing. But then in another slide, I think it was uh, in the geology paper showed that, yes, you do see some kind of halo around. Now, would you say that maybe some of the elements stay, others move? Is there a difference between the lights and the heavies? Uh, because what we see in carbonatites, for example, is that um, the lighter of elements stay. Okay, so in, in the literature, there is a lot of focus on the Hydrothermal stuff, but in my opinion, it is just because that's the easier things to look at. Most of the familiarization of the latter elements is magmatic, but then the um, the fluids that form a later phenite might move some of the heavies. Okay, now it doesn't really yeah. matter for carbonatite because there aren't that many he heavies to begin with, so you will not make a heavy deposit there. Uh, but it is um, something that you see in the geochemistry. So how does that? look like uh, in your rocks? Uh, very good point. Yes, the automatosomatism seems to definitely affect the, the or fractionate the heavies and the lights. Uh, at least in Ile um, I spent yeah, quite a lot of time picking apart the different rare earth minerals in these secondary assemblages. Uh, and then we found that uh, from a, a mass balance, like doing micro drilling on these pseudomorph assemblages, that the, um, the light rarities seem to mobilize more easily than the, high, the heavy. So the, hev the, the pseudomorphs are slightly enriched in heavy rares relative to the precursor eudialyte, but those light rares are probably reprecipitated uh, within the local outcrop. So on on the deposit scale, it's not uh, really changing the overall uh, distribution of light rarities. But of course, if we now crystallize our heavies in, um, uh, if we maintain these in the pseudomorph assemblages and the light rarities escape into the, or into the roof zone perhaps, then it does on the, on the deposits course, small scale. And then the processing scale uh, affect our distribution of heavy rarities and light rarities. Uh, then on the phenotization, 
um, also Chris looked at the, the ratios in he between heavies and light. I don't know the exact details on, on whether there was fractionation from the magma into the phenite, for example, but I do think there is a, a, an overall trend in um, which of the rare earths uh, are mobilized the furthest away. Um, that's a, did, that, that answer your question, well, didn't really answer your question. I don't think there is an answer, but yes, uh, there is effects on the fractionation between heavies and light. Okay, thanks. And um, uh, a point about oxygen fragacity. So, uh, <laughs> as you probably know, it's my uh, second favorite I was thing. This. <laughs> no, so um, something that um, we see, and uh, this is in modeling and now also in, uh, in actual oxygen uh, in carbonides, and something that uh, Marx and Markle have published on. Uh, Many years ago now is that the formation of methane yes. is something that happens, right? Because uh, you now you have all of the sodium there, and it has to go to some kind of mineral, right? Because it doesn't it just evaporate. And when it um, you have no other things for the sodium to bond with, let's say aluminium for feldspar or the feldspar toys is uh, <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> um, so uh, if you see some, some iron, then you start to make edging. But the problem is that if you don't have Fe3, you only have Fe2, you need to make the Fe3 from something, right? So yeah. what happens, it kind of forces uh, Fe2 into Fe3 by reducing it with uh, the water into methane, okay? So then one of the things we're thinking about, well, we need water to be kind of abundant at first, so we, we can fraction it on magma, but we don't want them to be too abundant. So then we're not kind of fracture the rock and uh, make everything into a finite and then kind of yeah. lose everything to, to the acid. Maybe one of the keys, something to look at is uh, the presence of edgerine of a fetsonite of those uh, very sodium rich Fe3 rich minerals, because if they're abundant, maybe what you're doing, you're taking H2O and making it into anything. And that's something that I think might be some of the key things here. Yeah, absolutely. And FO2, Good and point. the drop in FO2 is a result of this process. So FO2 itself doesn't control anything. It is a reflection of pretty much what FE2 and FE3 are doing in the system. Right, yeah. Uh, yeah, I fully agree. I guess uh, you, you understand the oxygen fugacity much, much better. I'm uh, just basically repeating what um, the work of uh, Michael Marx and, uh, and Gregor Markle. Uh, but yes, yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, I, nothing, it, there was not a, a question associated with it, I guess. No, I mean, the, uh, one of the, the questions here is what, what, what do you make of the kind of abundance of those minerals, of the sodium Fe3 minerals? Are they a significant part of the rock? Oh. Are they not so much? The abundance of uh, Fe3 minerals. Sodium Fe3, so no, things, th things like aging and all of those. Yeah, yeah, uh, but, but, but what is the, it's, they're, they're highly abundant, but was, then well, what is the question again? Yeah, so I was asking if if they they are abundant and if they are, then yes. Yeah, so that would be a hint of what do you do with all the water? Just make it into methane to make those minerals. Well, the agerine versus our fetsonite uh, issue is is an interesting thing that I, I can't quite wrap my, my head around myself. Um, or how this influences the, the formation of, uh, of methane, for example. Uh, because in Ilimausak, you get uh, both agerine dominated uh, luyevrites, for example, or, or the cocorticides are dominated by our fetsonite, so uh, both Fe3 and Fe2. Plus. But then the more it gets more evolved, the system gets more, um, or the oxygen fugacity increases, and you get agerine dominated dominated luyevrite. Then again, we find we get our fetsonite dominated luyevrite. So it's sort of shifting back and forth and, and the exact controls uh, or, or processes, reactions, redox reactions going on. Um, I, I don't 
know enough about to really comment. I think that's um, something we still have to, to work on. Very complicated stuff. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, thanks. But, yeah. but this is really, yeah. really important. The, the, the controls between redox and which mineral we're crystallizing or uh, the, the Fe3 versus Fe2 ratio uh, and then the associated volatiles with it. Okay. Great. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Nick. Um, I know we're just coming up uh, just over the hour now, but we maybe have one more question if it's still okay for you. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Great. Uh, yeah, we, we haven't got through all of them. Sorry for those that we haven't reached uh, yet, but we'll maybe go for one more. Um, so we have one here. Um, melt from metasomatized mantle sources are typically thought to be oxidized and hydrous, reflective of the slab component. Do you have any thoughts on how these melts are water poor and reduced despite coming from a metasomatized mantle source? Uh Good point. I wouldn't say they're they're water poor though. They're not they're not water poor. It's the again, coming back to the the fact that they're they are reduced, which then Michael pointed out is buffering process and what minerals were crystallizing, controlling the Fe three Fe two Fe three ratio, and that is controlling whether or not we're Exolving water or forming methane, methane etc. Uh, so they're not water poor. Uh, they're actually quite water rich if they end up, uh, because at the final stages, these, these reduced melts do get oxidized, and this is when the automatosomatism occurs. So, um, yeah, don't know if that answered the question. I think so. Yeah, that was a really good discussion. Hopefully we can yeah, all get rare earth element rich as well as water rich in the next <laughs> That's fantastic. Decades. Maybe just quickly, um, if you do need the certificate link, anyone, I did post it in the chat a little bit earlier, so do click on that if you need it. So yeah. Know. Otherwise, thanks a lot, Anouk. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. I think we can wrap it up here.